Good morning, brothers and sisters. Um, I'm really excited to worship with you this morning. So would you, if you're able, stand? Let's start by singing Hosanna together. Praises to our God who we've come to celebrate. Sing with me. Praise is rising. Praise is rising. Eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. I'd love to hear you guys sing. That's awesome. Hope is stirring. Hearts are yearning for you. We long for you. Because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away. They're washed away. take a quick minute to just give you a look at what's happening at GCBC this fall. If you've been around the church lately, you've probably heard about growth groups. This is a brand new ministry kicking off in just one week, but there's still time to get involved. That's right. The mission of these groups is to provide a place for followers of Christ to grow in their relationship with God and with each other. If you aren't already signed up to be a part of a group, you can do so by filling out a connection card in your bulletin or contacting the church office. We also have some returning ministries starting back up this fall. The men's prayer breakfast is back starting this Tuesday at 6 a.m. Food and coffee are provided, and there's no need to sign up. Just show up and be ready for God to work through your prayers. 
We're also starting a new session of Grief Share. This is a ministry to help people who are suffering with pain or grief. If you or someone you know has lost a loved one and is looking for healing, we hope you'll join us starting this Tuesday evening at 6.30. Last, but definitely not least, the Wednesday Night Children's Program is beginning something new this year. That's right. Starting this Wednesday, we'll be offering a meal from 6 to 6.30, open to everyone attending the Wednesday Night Program. This is our way of doing something tangible to share the love of Christ with these kids, and we're so excited to see how the Lord uses it. So if you know anyone with kids that aren't already signed up, let them know that we really want to be a blessing with this meal. Parents can register their kids by visiting the church website or at the door on Wednesday night. And that's what's launching this fall at GCBC. You can find more information about these and other ministries on the ministry display in the lobby. And don't forget to follow Gibson City Bible Church on Facebook for the latest updates. As always, if you have any questions, please contact the church office. Thank you for being a part of our mission to make disciples of Jesus Christ in Gibson City and around the world. Pray with me this morning. Our Father in heaven, uh, thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather in your presence, that we have to spend with one another, that we have to fellowship, and that we have uh, to sing praises to you. Uh, I pray that you would just fill this place right now, that you would come and speak to our hearts, that as we sing, uh, we would be encouraged, uh, and that you would be lifted high. In Jesus' name, amen. There is. There's not a lot that is more of a blessing than to worship with you all. Somebody asked me earlier this week how many singers were going to be on the praise team this week, and I told them, in all honesty, I said, I hope we've got two or three hundred. Um, we're not here to put on a show for you guys. We are here to stand with you or sit with you, for those of us on benches, before our God, praising him together. It's such a privilege. It's such a privilege. Let's do that right now. Um, stand once more if you're able. Let's sing his praises together. Crown him with many crowns. The
is worthy. Lift your voices with me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Good morning. If you would read with me, please. This is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, and then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness. For that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of the light and children of the day. Together. (laughs) 
for those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are, are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet of the hope of salvation. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other as indeed you are doing. You're welcome to be seated. As you do, would you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you that you have destined us to live in Christ. We think you've called us into a place where we can be part of building one another up, of encouraging one another, of growing together. We thank you for an opportunity like this to give toward that purpose, to give of what you've given us, what you've entrusted us with, be part of building your kingdom here in our midst. Bless these offerings now. Uh, may they be a blessing to you, our God. We ask in the name of Jesus, amen. I want to share a song with you this morning. It is a prayer of desire to be drawn near to the Lord, to know him better. As we prepare our hearts for what Pastor Tim is going to share with us, I hope this will be the prayer of every heart in this room.
Take us a little deeper. We want to know your heart. We want to know your heart. Because your love is so much sweeter than anything we've tasted. We want to know your heart. We want to know your heart. Well, it's a privilege uh, to be here again, to be able to speak with you again. Uh, Pastor Paul, Lord willing, should be back next week, um, so you can look forward to that. Um, this morning, what I want to do is uh, simply this. I want to um, do a couple things. One, I want to challenge you. Um, that's always a hope of mine. I hope that when you leave this place, you will feel challenged um, to do something, uh, whatever that might be. Uh, and my second hope is um, to share with you a little bit about this thing called growth groups that we've been talking about for a while. Uh, and hopefully through what we talk about today, through um, what we see uh, in scripture, uh, you will be a little, uh, hopefully challenged and hopefully your eyes will be opened um, to why we're doing what we're doing, to our goal, to our hope, uh, to our mission. Does that make sense? Um, so that's our goal this morning. Um, would you pray with me, please? Father, uh, we are getting ready to open your word. We are getting ready to uh, read and to talk about some uh, different issues, different things um, that we face in our lives, that we face as a church. I pray that as we do so, our hearts and our minds would be open uh, to what you would have to say, to what you would want from us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a pen, if you have a piece of paper, if you have a phone or an iPad, uh, I want you to write something down this morning. Every now and then, um, I like to have people do that, and I think um, it will prove beneficial to you. Uh, it might be a little discouraging, uh, but I want you to answer this question, and I want you to put it down in writing, uh, or at least attempt to. The question is this, why are you here this morning in this building? Why are you here? Why do you come to this place that we call church? Maybe you're here because uh, your parents make you come. Maybe you're here because that's what you've done for your entire life. You get up on Sunday morning and you go to church uh, unless you're sick or there's 10 feet of snow outside. Maybe you're here because it's tradition. Maybe you're here because somebody invited you. Maybe you're here uh, because you are absolutely struggling. Your life is a mess, uh, and you're looking for answers. And you thought, maybe I'll show up at church and give that a try. I don't know why you're here, uh, and I can't answer that question for you, and I shouldn't answer that question for you. Uh, but you absolutely need to answer that question for yourself. Why am I here this morning? Why am I involved in this thing called church? You see, I, I am uh, a fairly inquisitive guy. I like to ask why a lot. Um, but it's kind of ironic because I have two little kids, um, and they ask why way too much. <laughs> like, unbelievably way too much over the dumbest things. Like, I, I mean, it's crazy. Like, you'd be like, man, you need to eat your dinner. And it's like, why, why? And it's like, hey, I want pizza for dinner. And then it's like, okay. And an hour later, you're cooking pizza. And it's like, hey, we're having pizza tonight. And they say, why? Like, you said you wanted pizza, right? You know, like, hey, no, don't swing that golf club when Eloise is standing right in front of you. Why? Like, seriously, why? Like, we ask, my kids ask why way too much. You could ask Danielle, if you've got little kids, hopefully 
hopefully you experience it. Hopefully it's not just me uh, that has to go through that. But like they ask why constantly. And I think it's good for us as a church to ask why. I think it's good for us as individuals, as people, to ask why. I think when it comes to the Bible, I think when it comes to the way that we do things, I think we need to ask the question, why? I think it helps us. I think it's beneficial to us. You know, we look at God's word, and maybe you have questions. Maybe you ask why, you know? Like, love your enemies, Jesus teaches us. Why? You know? Don't be drunk with wine. Why? Go and spread the gospel. Why? Be generous. Give. Give your money. Give your time. Why? I think we need to ask those questions. And what I want us to do this morning, we're going to turn to the book of Hebrews, the letter uh, to the Hebrews. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to find a passage in which the author is instructing the people to do something. Uh, Three things, actually. And we're going to read those three things, and then we're going to ask the question, why? We're actually, uh, if you turn to the text, uh, it's Hebrews chapter 10, we're actually going to look at it backwards. uh, Because we're actually blessed here in that, oops, Um, We're actually blessed in that the writer gives us a reason why. But the writer, he gives the reason why prior to giving the instructions. So what I want to do is I want to start at the back end. I want to start at the instructions, uh, and then we're going to go back and ask why and look at why. So if you have your Bible, we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Um, and just a quick background. Uh, the letter, uh, this letter was written to the Hebrews. Uh, we don't know exactly who wrote it. There's a lot of debate. Uh, but what is the letter about? That's something that's important for us to know. And it's important for you to know this morning that the letter is extremely theological. That means it's very um, much like teaching oriented about God, about who he is. Um, most of this letter talks about Jesus and about who Jesus is as our great high priest, about what Jesus has done, okay, and who we are in relation to him and how that all fits together. So it's a very, very theological, it's a very, very, um, theoretical is probably a bad term, but it's a lot of um, just thought, it's a lot of deep, like, teaching, okay? But at this point in Hebrews chapter 10, the author is going to turn, and he's going to give some instructions. He's going to take the theology and he's going to turn it into some application. He's going to give us some practical things, okay? And that's what I want us to look at this morning. Uh, So there's three instructions that I told you, and we're going to look at them in Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, And we're going to start, and I'm just going to give you the instructions, and we're going to kind of walk through them. Instruction number one, uh, the author writes, and he says, let us draw near to God. If you look in verse 22 of Hebrews chapter 10, he says, let us draw near with a true heart, And full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. The author of this letter is writing to the people and he's telling them, let us draw near to God. Simple. Let us draw near to him. And he says, let us draw near to him with a sincere heart. Uh, Let us draw near to him with full assurance of faith. Basically what he's saying is come to God. Draw near to him. Okay? First instruction, first exhortation. First challenge to you this morning, first challenge to me, let us draw near to God. Why? It's probably the easiest one to answer of all of these. Uh, But why? Why draw near to God? Instruction number two, if you keep reading, and we go to verse 23, he says, let us hold on to our hope. If you look in Hebrews 10, 23, he says, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful let us hold on to our hope let us hold fast to the confession of our hope what does that mean what do we hold to what is our hope we're going to read about it when we answer why but ultimately like our hope is found in the cross our hope is found in the death and the resurrection of Christ our hope is found in who Jesus is This letter that is very theological in tone but gets very practical right here talks so much about the hope that we have because Christ came and died for us. So as the author, as the writer of this letter writes to the people, he says, remember all the stuff that we have talked about in chapters 1 through 9, 1 through 10? 
Remember all that teaching about Jesus, about who he is, about who you are in relation to him? Hold on to that. Hold on to the hope that you have in Christ. Hold on to it. So he says, let us draw near to God. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope. And then third and finally, and then when we get there, we'll probably spend the most time talking about this one. He says, let us encourage one another. Verse 24, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. He says, let us encourage one another. And the encouragement that he's talking about, I've got to be honest, isn't this encouragement like, not that it's bad, but it's not like, oh man, like, you know, your car broke down and you're having a bad day, like, I'm going to encourage you. Like, it's a deeper encouragement that, than that. It's not a man, like, you know, my kid lost his soccer game, like, I need to, you know, it's not like this, I'm just bummed out kind of encouragement. The encouragement that he's talking about here, I mean, at the beginning, he says, let us consider how to stir one another up for love and good works. The encouragement that he's talking about is, let's get together and encourage one another to be better Christians. Let's encourage one another to serve the Lord. Let us encourage one another to love each other. It's not an encouragement because you're sad. It's not an encouragement because your team lost the game and we feel bad for you. It's an encouragement like we're on a mission and we need to be challenged day in and day out to pursue that mission, to fulfill that mission. Let us encourage one another. So those are the three. Those are the three instructions. Let us draw near to God. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope and let us encourage one another. Let us encourage one another. And we read these three instructions and we must then ask ourselves the question, why? Why would the author of this letter write to the people and say, draw near to God, hold fast to your confession and encourage one another? What was common in the early church? What was something that was so, so common in the early church? What happened so often to the people of the early church? Day in and day out, they faced persecution. The early church risked their lives for what they believed. The early church risked being thrown into prison, risked losing everything for the mission that God had placed them on because of what they believed in, because they followed Jesus. So we see that, and, and we don't face that like they did back then, and that's okay, and this isn't like, oh man, we should face that kind of a thing. But we read this, and we kind of get what they were up against. And while you and I may not be facing prison, and we may not be facing death for our, for, because of our faith, we do encounter trials, and we do encounter struggles, and we do face things that are challenging. And while I might not face being thrown in prison because of what I believe, my mission today is the same as their mission was back then. And your mission today as a follower of Christ is the same as their mission was back then. So, just as they needed to stir one another up to love and good works, just as they needed to encourage each other, just as they needed to draw near to God, just as they needed to hold fast to the hope that they have in Christ, so also do you. So do I. Let's ask why. Let's ask why. And let's go back to Hebrews chapter 10, uh, but we're going to skip back to verse 19. We're going to back up. Okay, and we're going to go to verse 19. Uh, and as we read verse 19, what I want to do as we get here is uh, I want us to answer the question, why? Why draw near to God? Why hold fast to the hope? And why encourage one another? We're going to find two reasons. Uh, but let's go. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Um, and I think I might have it on the screen. Here we go. It's kind of small, uh, so hopefully you can see it. And let's read Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. It says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, 
that is through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, since we have these things, let us draw near with a true heart. Why draw near with a true heart? Because he has made it possible for us to do so. Do you see what it says there? Verse 19 is like crucial here. Since we now have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. You see, Jesus did something that no man could ever have done. Jesus did something that was impossible. If you look back to the Old Testament, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, what you know is that the priests would constantly be making sacrifices. Sacrifices to atone for their sins, the sins of the people. They would go and they would sacrifice a bull or a goat or a ram or a sheep or whatever, and they would make these sacrifices and they would do it in an attempt to atone for the sins. But what we know is this. What we know is this, that those atonements were only temporary and those atonements did not bring forgiveness. How do I know that? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11, we read down, it says this. It says, every priest stands daily at his service offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. So if you lived in the Old Testament times, um, you would sin, right? And you would have to go through a priest, and the priest would make sacrifices on your behalf. Jesus made it possible so that I never have to go killing a sheep. I don't have to bring Pastor Paul a goat, you know? Like, he made it possible that I have direct access to God the Father, and he did so because Jesus shed his blood. He did so because he gave up his life when he didn't have to. The why, why draw near to God? Why hold fast my confession of faith? Why stir one another up? It all goes back to the cross. It all goes back to who he is and what he's done. So when, when I sit here and I, and I think about why we're here this morning, and I think about why you're here this morning, and I think about what we're doing in this place and why we do church the way that we do it, and why I need to draw near to God, and why I need to hold fast to my confession, and why why I need to encourage one another and why I need to encourage you and I need you to encourage me. It all centers back to the fact that God has made it possible for us to know him through the blood of Jesus. And then this, this chapter is kind of bookended. If you look at the very end, the very last phrase of this passage that we're reading in verse 25, when he says, encouraging one another, he says, all the more as you see the day drawing near. What is this day? It might be capitalized in your Bible. He talks about this day that is drawing near. The day that he's referring to is the second coming of Christ. Jesus is coming back. The same Jesus that came and lived and died in my place and shed his blood so that I don't have to go killing any rams or goats or anything like that anymore. This same Jesus died, gave me access to God, and he's coming back again. So as we as a church body sit here, and as we, as followers of Christ, sit here, we must ask the question, what does the blood of Jesus and the fact that he is returning again impact my life today? How does it impact my life today? What does it do for me today? And the response is simple. I must draw near to God. I must hold fast to my confession. And I must encourage one another. I must encourage you. You must encourage me. I must seek to stir you up to do good things, to love people. Because it all centers back to who Jesus is and what Jesus done, has done. You see, earlier I had mentioned that I mentioned that this letter is very theological, right? It's very theological, uh, but it also turns very practical. Uh, and I think it's important for us today as the church uh, to have both good theology, uh, but also to have practical application of that theology, right? I think it's important for us to know what we believe, but also to live it out. Think about this. What is better? Would it be better uh, for somebody to be sitting in this room and to know their Bible cover to cover? To know everything about it, to have good theology, good beliefs about who God is, about the Trinity, about, you know, whether or not it's okay for women to be pastors, and whether it's okay to speak in tongues, and whether, uh, you know, you have to be baptized to be saved or not. You know, all these different things. Is it better for somebody to have the best theology and the best beliefs about all of those things? but be a scumbag of a husband 
or to be a cheat of a businessman or to be selfish or to treat his neighbor like garbage? Is it better to have good theology but live like the devil? Or what about this? What if, what if you've got a woman or a man or a young person sitting in this room that loves their neighbor, that would give you the shirt off her back, that is incredibly generous, that is kind, that goes and like sits with people at the nursing home and that, you know, helps little kids, tutors them at school and mentors a kid. Such a good person. But she thinks that all roads lead to heaven. You know, I can earn my salvation by doing enough good. You know, Muhammad and Jesus, they were kind of equal, right? Like... You know, so which is worse? You've got the guy that is super doctrinally and theologically sound, but is a jerk. Or you've got the lady who's super kind, but doesn't know a lick about the Bible and clearly doesn't know what it takes to be a follower of Jesus. What is better? The answer is simply this. They're both bad. Like, it's not a what is better. The answer is simply we need to understand who Jesus was, who Jesus is, what he's done, And then we need to take that and allow him to change our lives because of what we believe, because of the hope that we have in him. So I come and I read here and I sit here and I think about what we see in the book of, or the letter written to the Hebrews. And I think about why we're in this room this morning. And I ask myself the question, am I here just because I'm checking a box off my to-do list? Am I here because I've done too much bad this week and I'm trying to make up for it, you know? Am I here because I think it's vital to the mission that God has called me to? And that's the question that we have to ask ourselves. That's the question that you must ask yourselves. Are we glad that you're here regardless of your reason? Absolutely. You know, we want you to be here. We think it's good. But ultimately... The church as a whole, globally, must get a grip on why we exist. And as we do that, and as we get a grip on why we exist, we must recognize that these three challenges, these three challenges, let us draw near to God. Where are they? Not there. Um, Let us draw near to God. Let us hold fast to our hope. And let us stir one another up to good works. Let us encourage each other. They are central to the Christian life. Those three things are central to what you do as a Christian. They should be, at least. You see, it all goes back to our mission. Uh, And this is where I'm going to talk a little bit about groups and why we're doing what we're doing here. Is simply this. Our church has a mission statement. If you've got a bulletin and you open it up, I think it's in there. And I think if you, it's like like a little blue line, like across the edge of it. And it says this. It says that the mission of the Gibson City Bible Church is to glorify God by making disciples of Jesus Christ both here in Gibson City and around the world. Does it say that? Am I right? It says something like that? Okay, so it says that in your bulletin. It's written on the, we get compliments about that, the guy that did that thing out there, like on the ceiling out there. Um, it says it, like we post it places. The reality is this. There are far too many people in this room that have not owned that mission. And that's not a knock on you guys. And that's not a knock on me or the staff or the elders or anybody. The reality is this. We must... We must, as a church, as followers of Christ, whether you're a farmer or a teacher or a lawyer or whatever you do, a car mechanic or you work for State Farm or whatever it is, whatever you do, we must get a grip and recognize that we are all on this mission together. We are on this mission because Christ has come and he has died for us. He has given us a reason to live. He has given us a purpose. And without the cross and without his resurrection... Why be in this room this morning? I'd be the first one out the door if Jesus didn't come and die for me. I'd be on hole number nine right now. But I believe that Jesus came and died, that he shed his blood, giving me access to God the Father. 
And I believe that there's a day coming when Jesus is going to return. And as it's written in Matthew, he talks about separating the sheep from the goats. He's going to come and he's going to take his family to be with him. The followers of Jesus are going to go and spend eternity with him. And then those who have not followed Christ, those who have not experienced his grace, will suffer eternal condemnation. Like, I believe that's going to happen. So because Jesus died, because I believe a day is coming, I make it my aim and my goal to be on this mission of making disciples, of telling people about who he is. And that mission is not just for people who work on staff at a church. That mission is not just for people who are over 18 years of age. That mission is not just for men. It's not just for women. That is a mission that we all must seek to fulfill. Whether you're a stay-at-home mom, whether you're a stay-at-home dad, whether you play in a band and travel the world, whatever you do, like, you're a part of this mission. If you're a part of this church, you must be a part of this mission. Making disciples. And it all goes back to the cross. So then we look here to these three instructions, right? Hold fast, draw near to God, hold fast, and let us consider how to stir one another up to good works. How well are you doing at those three things? How well am I doing at those three things? Do I draw near to God? When I'm not here on Sunday morning or when I'm not sitting in my office throughout the week, do I draw near to God? Do I open his word? Do I spend time in prayer? Do I talk with my family about God, about what he's doing in my life? It's so easy. Um, It's so easy for me as a pastor on staff at a church to spend hours like here reading my Bible and preparing to teach and preparing a lesson uh, and then to go home and to be exhausted and to not want to read another word on a page uh, and then to go home and have like the chaos of little kids. And it's so easy for me to just get caught up and say, look, I'm just going to read what I need to read to teach and to do all this stuff. But what happens is I'm not drawing near to God when I, when I do that. Yeah, I'm learning, and yeah, I'm growing, but ultimately, like, am I taking time and saying, God, I want to know you? God, I need your help. God, if my marriage is going to survive, God, if my wife is going to see the love that I have for her, God, if my kids are going to grow up, and if they're going to know you, and if they're going to join this mission as well, they need to see it with me first. God, if my neighbors, I met Hopefully, I don't know if they're here or not. They're probably not. But like I met these people uh, who live two doors down from me. Um, and they actually don't live there. Their mom lives there. Um, and they're here taking care of her. And they were outside last night and I met them. Uh, and I went over and I talked to them. And I could be wrong, uh, but they did not, uh, through the things that they were saying and the way that they were talking and the stories that they had told me, uh, they did not come off as if they were very religious people. Um, for lack of a better way to say it. Um, So I was talking to them, uh, and I've got to recognize this, that like, if those people are going to come to know Jesus, who better to show them Jesus than the guy that's two houses down? You know? But if I'm not, if I'm not drawing near to God, how am I going to do that? I must draw near to God. You must draw near to God. As we seek to accomplish this mission, we must have the Holy Spirit inside of us. We must be seeking after him, and we must draw near to him with everything that we've got because the mission, the task is great. Seven billion people in the world, near, nearly half of those people, three-something three something billion people in the world don't know who Jesus is. If I myself here in religious East Central Illinois am not drawing near to God, how will I ever effectively reach lost people, lost people, people who don't know Jesus? Draw near to God. Hold fast to the confession of your hope. Uh, It is so easy in our world, in our culture, in our society um, to struggle with holding fast to what we believe in. Why is it so hard for us to struggle with that sometimes? You know, we see natural disaster. We see this hurricane come and just absolutely wipe out much of, you know, Houston and Texas. We see things like that happen. We see family members, loved ones, 
get diagnosed with terminal diseases. We see, you know, people lose children at young ages, way before we ever would imagine it was their time. And it's so hard because we see the circumstances of this life and the trials that we face, and it's so very easy, so very easy to say, God, like, are you even there? God, like, I know when I was younger, I prayed this prayer and said I believed in you, but it sure doesn't seem like you're anywhere around right now, right? Like, it's so easy for us to give up hope. But I, I wonder, if I lived 2,000 years ago, at the time of the apostles, you know, around the time of Jesus, I wonder... I wonder how much easier it would have been to give up hope back then when they knew, like, I'm going there and they're probably going to throw me in jail because I'm going to tell people about Jesus. I wonder if I knew, like, I might get stoned to death, where my hope would be, whether I would hold on to my hope or not. The point is this, like, circumstances must not dictate what you and I believe. Job lost everything that he had. Everything, family, cattle, home, he got sick. He lost it all, but he held fast to his hope. He held fast to his belief. He held fast to the fact that he knew that God was faithful and that God was good. What about you? In the midst of your circumstances, in the midst of what you're doing, in the midst of this mission that we are on together, are you holding fast? Last week we talked about uh, setting our eyes and fixing our eyes on Christ, on the prize that lies ahead of us. If I start looking here and looking there, it's gonna be so easy to let go of that hope that I have. It's gonna be so easy to forget what God has done for me. It's gonna be so easy to forget that Jesus has changed my life, that he has given me hope, that he has given me a reason to live. You have a reason to live. If you're a follower of Christ in this room, you have a reason to to live, and that reason is to go and to tell people about Jesus. The reason is to make disciples. The reason is because Jesus has given us hope. Draw near to God, hold fast to the confession, and let us encourage one another. Let us encourage one another. Let us stir one another up to good deeds. Let us, let us build each other up. So, so many times in churches, you hear stories of infighting, of people that simply can't get along, uh, simply, like, I heard about this church uh, just recently in Ohio, um, and they actually, I don't know exactly what happened, uh, but they tried to uh, remove the whole elder board at once, okay? Like, they just tried to, like, they tried to get rid of them. Something must have happened, and they tried to get rid of the entire elder board. Like, they had this big vote and all this stuff, uh, and that is, like, so divisive, is it not? And maybe they had good reason. I don't know. Uh, but all I know is this, that when they're focused on, like, these little differences and their disagreements, what they're not doing is effectively pursuing the mission that the church has of making disciples. It's so easy for us to get caught up in just things around us, and we must recognize that I need you, and you need me, and you need each other, because we are a team, and we are on a mission, and we must pursue that mission. And the only way for me to be able to make it, the only way for me to be able to continue to pursue that mission effectively, I need people supporting me. I need people helping me. And it's not... We get, there's so many sweet people in churches, right? Like, there's so many people that just like, look, man, like, you're having a bad day. I'm going to encourage you. And I think that's so necessary. And I think we see that a lot in church. But I think what we don't see enough of is people saying, hey, like, do you have any, like, coworkers that don't know Jesus that you're trying to talk to? You know, are you mentoring any young Christians or any people that you want to encourage to come up? Like, you know, we're so good about helping people when they're down and sad, but we're not always so good at challenging people to hold fast to this mission that God, God has given us. Like, I can't stress enough, like, your mission my mission as a Christian, as a member, as a part of the Gibson City Bible Church is to make disciples. And if I am not doing that, I'm failing. And if you are not doing that, 
you're failing. There is a day that is coming and we must stir one another up to good works and we must encourage one another because we have hope that Jesus is coming back for us. And we also recognize that there is a world outside of these doors that is dying and going to hell. And it's our duty, it's our job to go and to tell them. So that's why, you know, we come and just, this is a quick little plug about why we're doing these growth groups. That's a big reason why we're doing it because I'll be honest, and uh, Pastor Paul may or may not say this, the elders may or may not say this, but I'm gonna say this. Like I firmly believe, personally, this isn't on behalf of the church or anything, I firmly believe that coming and sitting in this room is not sufficient for me to grow or for you to grow as a follower of Christ. It's not. You must get outside of these four walls of, with other believers and encourage each other along this mission of growing and developing disciples. You must. Because otherwise, what happens is we just get into this routine and this tradition of sitting and going and sitting and going and sitting and going when the reality is, like, we're supposed to be on mission and we need each other. And there's people that come into this building, there's people that are sitting in this room right now that will come into this room, and whether by their choice or not, they will get up and they will leave, having not hardly spoken to anybody except, hey, how are you? I'm fine. That's not sufficient for us to pursue this mission. That's not stirring one another up for good deeds. That's being friendly. And if I wanna go and be friendly somewhere, like, there's a lot of places I could do that. Go to the school, go to the golf course, go to... I don't know, a hockey game? Like, there's a lot of places you can go and be friendly. Our job is not to come into this building and put on nice clothes and dress fancy and, you know, put on a smiling face and act like everything is okay. Our job is to get together as the body of Christ, recognize that we have a goal in mind, we have a mission in mind, and to pursue that goal with everything that we've got. And as we do that, we must draw near to God, we must hold fast to our beliefs, and we must encourage each other along the way. How are you doing? How am I doing? My hope is not, my goal is not that you would feel bad. My goal is that you would be awakened to this mission, right? That you would be awakened to the fact that like, you're not alone, you're a part of a team. And we as a team must seek to reach the lost. There's 15,000, 20,000 people within a 15-mile radius of here, um, the majority of, majority of whom would probably say they're Christians but aren't involved in this mission, aren't involved in the body of Christ, many of whom are lost and will die and will spend eternity apart from Christ. That's a problem. And it's our job, with the help and the power of God and the Holy Spirit in us, to seek to reach them to seek to tell them about the hope that we have in Christ, to seek to tell them that we now have access to God because Jesus has shed his blood for us. So I would encourage you, think about where you are, think about what you do, why you do it, and think about how you're involved in the body of Christ. And I would encourage you, get involved with a group, get involved with a Sunday school class, Get involved with a mentor or something like that so that you are no longer trying to fight this battle of life, trying to fight this war and win people to Jesus by yourself. You're not supposed to. We're not supposed to. We need Jesus and we need each other. We're gonna close with a song. Um, and as we do, I'd just like to pray for you guys. Uh, I'd like to pray for us as a church um, and just recognize the task is great and we're all on this journey together. Our Heavenly Father, uh, we fully, fully are um, recognizing the fact that um, there are people outside of these walls, there are people within these walls that need you. Uh, and we ask that you would help us to go and to make disciples uh, as our mission states, as your word commands us to do. I pray that you would help us to see that it's important to draw near to you, to hold fast to what we believe in, and to encourage one another. Lord, please help us uh, to do so. I pray 
uh, this morning, that you would help us to build each other up, that we would recognize that we are not just people that go to the same church, but that we are on a team together, on a mission together. In Jesus' name. All right, let's stand together. Spirit, we are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our say we will work with each other. We will walk with each other. We will walk side by side. We will work with each other. We will work side by side. And we'll guard each one's dignity and save each one's pride. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. walk with each other. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. And together we'll spread the news that God is in our land. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. Yeah. 